Hello, AP World students. Well, this lesson is uh, kind of a doozy. Uh, you want to talk about biting off a big old hunk. That's sort of what we're doing here. So this is about the second half of the Second World War, particularly from the moment that the United States enters the war through to its conclusion. Um, we're just going to be focusing on some major events, major turning points, and then the character of the how the war concludes. All right. So I know there's a million details I'm leaving out, and I probably have some of you students who are kind of World War II buffs who are thinking, oh my gosh, he left out this and that and this and that. And look, we know how this course goes. It's sort of mile wide, inch deep. And so that's kind of how we're going to have to treat this lesson as much as it pains me in my heart to do that. Uh, and for those of you who know some basics about the Second World War, I promise we'll have some new pieces in here for you. So major events in the conclusion of the Second World War. You can see the learning target here talks about detailing the turning points, and we'll see that. And then this long-term learning target that we're really going to continue to unpack. I can examine the darkest, un the darkest undercurrents of modernity in human nature. We're going to have to look that in the eye today. So I mentioned that this is from the part of the war on where the United States is involved. How did the United States get involved? Well, for as much focus as we paid last time to, to the events in Europe, and frankly, for as much focus as Americans in the 30s were paying to Europe, it really was the war in East Asia that would pull the United States in. And uh, to understand that, we have to understand the course that Japan was on, all right? So again, Japan is an industrialized world power that sees itself as one of the, the you know, the imperial states in the world. Japan, the Japanese islands, for all their beauty and relative size, they're pretty resource poor. And so they feel like they are on this expansion course because they need to expand to acquire more resources. And they are doing that into, you know, onto the East Asian mainland. We've learned about that before. Now, Japan also begins to calculate that, you know, um, the Soviet Union, uh, the rump end of the Soviet Union is probably not their problem. China has been subdued. Uh, China is like being, you know, just beaten on at this point. So China is not a problem. But certainly the United States, which is a large presence on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, the United States might be a problem for them. The United States possesses the Philippines and Hawaii, Guam, Wake Island, all these, all these territories out there. So Japan sees the United States as a potential issue. And when, uh, at a certain point, when the United States uh, says to Japan, you know, because you're being so aggressive, Japan, we're going to put this punitive measure on. We're going to punish you by cutting off our oil exports to you. We're not selling any more American oil to you. At that point, Japan calculates, A, that hurts our oil supply. B, America is signaling its intentions that they are, they are no friend to us and they are becoming our enemy. And so at that point, Japan... Japanese leaders led by their prime minister, Hideki Tojo, calculate war with the United States is inevitable. It is going to happen at a certain point. And so the calculation is we should attack them now while they're not ready. Uh, a sneak attack, some sort of attack on the United States Pacific Force, which is just parked there in Hawaii at their base called Pearl Harbor. If we could crush the American fleet at Pearl Harbor, we, it would take them a year, two years, whatever it would take to sort of fully rebuild and kind of get back, get back. And that's just talk, counting their material strength. It, would, it might take even longer for them psychologically to recover from, from a crippling attack. And during that time, Japan reasons, we could sort of entrench ourselves, ourselves across uh, East and Southeast Asia. So they, they, they decide to attack uh, a country, a neutral country. They attacked the United States. Now, again, the United States had been inching toward the war. We were furnishing the war and paying for the war. Japan would say, you basically were in the war in all but name anyway. Uh, but the United States is able to say, we weren't fighting anyone until December 7th, 1941, this date that will live in infamy when Japan attacks the United States military base uh, at Pearl Harbor. And now we ain't neutral no more. Now the United States of America is in the war. This plan of Japan's to completely cripple the American naval fleet is um, almost successful. It's nearly successful. It, this, this attack is, is really devastating. It's really bad. However, it's not quite as devastating as Japan needed it to be. The Americans luck out just a little bit. We are caught napping at this attack, and, and we luck out. And also, the United States responds 
militarily, but also civilian-wise and industrially we respond because the the rebuilding of our naval fleet, the, the being able to be fully mobilized and back to full strength doesn't take years. Instead, it takes the United States about six months. And if Japan underestimated anything, they underestimated the full industrial might of the United States, you know, and especially after the Great Depression, it's like the United States is now sort of fully arising and back on its feet. And this this old adage of Japan awakened a sleeping giant, I mean, that, that adage has never been more true than it was in the United States with regard to the United States of America. And now the U.S. is just pumping out military material, right? And using propaganda to motivate American workers, like we've got to get to work. We're going to avenge December 7th. We are furnishing the war, not just for ourselves, but also for the British and the Soviets, even the Canadians. Uh, and so here we see all these 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 cones of, um, of uh, bomber planes, jets being built. And we'll note it's women doing the work on this. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. And so at this point, once Japan attacks Pearl Harbor, the Second World War hits its, I guess you could say, classic stage where there's three key allies, the British, the Soviets, and the Americans, and there's three key Axis powers of the Nazis, Imperial Japan, and again, the junior partner of Italy. So let's talk about the home front, and I'm going to focus on the home front in the allied countries, which of course includes the United States now. So for civilians, um, the war brought a lot of change, right? A lot of profound change took place. Um, you know, uh, in a place like the United States or Britain, let's say, um, you know, these are capitalist countries, but now there's like pretty heavy duty uh, government controls on what people can buy. This is rationing, right? And if you want to buy gasoline, you have to have these government coupons or these rationing coupons. Or if you need want to buy food, you have, these, have to have these rationing coupons for meat, for sugar, for all kinds of stuff. If you want to buy anything with steel in it or anything with rubber in it, this is all rationed out. So people couldn't just consume willy-nilly. They now had to sort of put up with these government rationing efforts that were, and the idea is, well, all this stuff is needed for the war. There's also a ton of effort made to say, we want to put people, we want to put everyone to work, women now included. This famous Rosie the Riveter image, maybe the most famous propaganda image of all time, uh, encouraging women to get to work in the types of work typically that were traditionally not available to women. And so this is going to be a tremendous social change uh, that, that, that Americans kind of dip their toes into and British and the British dip their toes into because it's, uh, it's like afterwards women are sort of encouraged to go back into sort of certain other types of feminine work, but it's it, it doesn't, that doesn't last much longer. Like this, this era of women being able to choose more or less whatever sort of work they wanted to in the West really is, a, is an effect of the Second World War. And in fact, it's just like this, it was just seen as a necessity. Um, you know, there's a blitz of government propaganda in Britain and the United States. Uh, and this propaganda has a certain, there's a ton of it. And again, government propaganda doesn't necessarily mean government lies. It just means sort of an official campaign, an official message from your government. Your government would like you to do some things. And so in order to win the war, the government would like you to, to shut up, just stop talking. If you've learned any information, if you know the whereabouts of like your boy and where he's stationed in Italy, don't say anything to anyone because there may be spies. We don't know where the spies are. The spies could be anywhere. And so we need everyone to kind of be tight-lipped. As I said, loose lips sink ships, you know, and so... So the idea is just keep it to yourself, guys. The government wants you to be quiet. The government wants you to produce. The government wants you to get after it and work. No more calling in sick. No more going to the nurse's office. There's just like everyone, get to work, get to work, get to work. Why? Because we need to win the war. You know who loves it when you call in sick? You know who loves it when you take it easy? You know who loves it when you, whatever, play games during your open hour instead of do your homework? Hitler loves that, right? The, the Axis powers love it. So it, Hitler, cartoon Hitler, kind of weird, pats this guy on the, on the shoulder and says, thanks for loafing, pal, and gives him a Nazi medal. Loves it when people sort of lean on their shovels instead of getting to work. The government tells us we need everyone to sacrifice. We need everyone to make do with less, eat a little bit less certain foods, put up with less certain products. 
Um, don't drive alone to work because when you ride alone, you ride with Hitler. Hitler loves it when you drive a car by yourself because you're wasting precious gasoline. Uh, so instead, we should carpool and do car sharing clubs. And finally, the government wants us to remember who we're fighting and hate them. So there's all these messages with like really kind of racially touchy language, right? Sort of saying, remember who the bad guy is. Remember who the enemy is. Remember what like the Japanese did to our soldiers at um, in the Philippines in this in this Bataan death march. And don't forget it. And so get to work. And so there's this blitz of messaging, more, much more kind of government messaging than civilians are typically used to, much more e control of the economy. Um, you know, something like General Motors doesn't make a single car during the war years because they are sort of taking orders from one customer. That customer is not the public. That customer is the government saying, we want you to build tanks and trucks and everything for the army instead. Now, for people who lived in France, which was controlled by the Nazis, you know, this is, it's really complicated for civilians there. You know, the Nazis in France set up a puppet government. So it looked French, um, but the French people understood, yeah, this, this, it's, it's a, <laughs> the government looks French, but they're taking orders from the Nazis. Uh, Vichy, France. Vichy is the name of the city or the region where this new government was located. This is kind of a puppet government, right? It's a French government, but it's operated and controlled by the Nazis. And, you know, the French public looks at this with a good degree of suspicion, let's say. And, and even like, you know, so there's Nazis everywhere in France and, and people are taking note who's collaborating with the Nazis, who's helping the Nazis. As this woman is unfortunately finding out who's got a Nazi boyfriend, right? Who's sort of keeping the Nazis company? Who has a kid with Nazi soldiers? This is all, you know, um, after they're liberated from Nazi rule, there is like some heavy shunning and shaming going on here for people, locals who collaborated with the Nazis while they were there. In other places, like in Poland, there was, they, the, the Nazis never even bothered setting up a, a, a puppet government. They just ruled them with martial law, military law, and ruled them with extreme prejudice and extreme violence. Uh, we'll get to the Holocaust in a moment. Uh, that's that's sort of what happens in Poland um, or China. Right? China is just sort of occupied by the, the Japanese with extreme prejudice. And, and reasons why some places got it worse than others basically have to do with old ethnic and racial grudges uh, being played out here. Um, so, yeah, sometimes a local person might collaborate with foreign occupiers. And maybe that local person says, hey, look, Here's what's going on. I'm doing this because I'm trying to look out for my fellow Frenchmen or my fellow whatever, Chinese or, or Dutch people, you know, uh, and I'm trying to run interference between them and the Nazis and make it as light a, a burden as we possibly can. I think it's fair to say that local French or Poles or Dutch people didn't exactly say thank you to the people who collaborated with, with those people. And also we'll note there's plenty of resistors. There's an active Dutch resistance, Polish resistance, French resistance, people who go underground and do sabotage work or spying work, trying to sort of disrupt the, the Axis powers any possible way they can, even after their countries had been conquered. You know, one thing that's true for civilians during this war is that um, the war was touching them. This is not a war that has nice, neat distinctions between civilian life and soldier life. In fact, war in the modern era does not really make a distinction between civilian life and soldier life, between military targets and civilian targets. The, the part of the reason is this whole concept of, of total war. And the idea of total war is in order to defeat an enemy power, you not only have to defeat their whatever, you know, military capacity they have, but defeating the military capacity they have means defeating their economic capacity. It means defeating their ability to produce, produce weapons that will resist, that they use to resist. In fact, it means producing, it means destroying or defeating or crushing their whole desire to resist, which means, which involves inflicting maximum suffering. And so maybe at first there's some effort to say, ah, we shouldn't bomb this area because that's really just civilian targets. That's just, that's a neighborhood, that's factories, that's museums and churches. At a certain point, it's like, you look, you got to destroy 
factories and you got to destroy the neighborhoods around them. And if you end up hitting a hospital, then golly, that's just too bad. That's the nature of war these days, right? And so you got to go after their infrastructure. Like you have to destroy their ability to resist you militarily, their ability to resist you economically and like produce military weapons and the ability and their will to resist you, which means crushing them and letting them understand they must be made to understand you have been defeated. This war is over. And so the experience of, in particular, Germans and Japanese civilians in this war by the end is miserable because this total war ideology is they need to be made, they need to, their, all their weapons of resistance have been taken away and they are, need to be made to understand that they must stop resisting because they have been defeated. So how are like the Nazis defeated in Europe? Well, it's this whole multi-front attack, right? From the south, this is the easy part that they call that the soft underbelly of Europe, the junior partner of Europe, of the Axis powers. Italy is defeated by invasions from the south. From the east, the Soviets do this heroic work of like absorbing the Nazi invasion and then beginning the pushing back process starting at Stalingrad and like slowly but surely, this is where Nazi forces are, are, are really first forced onto their heels and they're beginning to absorb blows that are devastating. And then from the West, the uh, extraordinarily high degree of difficulty of the D-Day invasions where the uh, British Canadians and Americans, led by the Americans, in fact, uh, from Great Britain, cross the English Channel, form a beachhead in France and begin sort of landing troops and forcing them back from the West. And so now the Nazis are being closed in on from all sides. So yeah, Stalingrad marks that turning point in the East. D-Day is that turning point in the West. And following that, like the, the pinch is on and it's now less than a year later. So the, the you know, Stalingrad is 43, D-Day is 44. And by spring 45, the war has closed out in Europe and Adolf Hitler does the universe a favor and ends his own life. Um, but what's really shocking or startling to everybody, of course, is the recognition that once they get behind enemy lines in Nazi Germany, everybody understood the Nazis weren't, weren't, Santa, Claus, weren't Santa Claus. Everybody understood the Nazis had, a, had a, a grudge against Jews and other groups Nobody quite understood the, the depths of the wickedness and depravity that was going on in Europe in those years. And here we see this, you know, darkness of, of the modern era, darkness of human nature uh, in full bloom. You know, I have like sort of a weird sick math problem. You, you take a broken human nature that is like crippled with sin, plus we pump it up with nationalism, uh, this this notion or hope of self determination. All nations should have their own. All national groups should have their own country. And sometimes it also means we should get certain people in our country who aren't part of our national group out of our country. Uh, totalitarianism or fascism, scientific racism, this belief that like you know ours is a superior species, our race is a superior species to other races, industrial technologies, and we see these modern atrocities in the 20th century that are wicked like nothing else in history, right? It's these large-scale genocides where some particular ethnic, racial, or religious group is targeted and, and systematically wiped out. Most famously, of course, this is the Holocaust. But before the Holocaust, it happened at the end of World War in, with Armenians in Southeast Europe who were targeted by, by Turks uh, and the Ottoman Empire. Um, Cambodians uh, targeted in what's called the Khmer Rouge genocide in the 1970s by the communists in Cambodia. Could be Rwandans um, in the Rwandan genocide of the 1990s or Bosnian Croats who were targeted by Bosnian Serbs in the 1990s. Like there's far too many of these examples of like people groups systematically being wiped out or exterminated. The interesting piece here, of course, with the Holocaust gang is that the full, there were stories about the Holocaust that floated out, stories that, you know, what people knew was that Jews had been transported out of Germany and they were being trucked and, and loaded onto trains in Poland and Eastern Europe. Um, and certainly no, everyone assumed they're not being led on vacation, you know, like 
they're probably being put in these work camps. But And even the term concentration camp that people knew, that just means we're going to concentrate them here. We're going to keep them here. So the understanding of most of the outside world was that Jews are kind of being dislocated, right? Moved to some other place and probably facing harsh treatment. Stories floated out that like, no, no, this isn't harsh treatment. This is, uh, this is extermination. But they were, they were so hysterical sounding that people couldn't believe them. Um, they weren't really believed when these stories floated out. It's also worth noting that while the Jews were the primary target, the most significant target and the main targets of this, uh, they, it was also other groups, right? Uh, Roma uh, are an ethnic group, sometimes called gypsies. It's not really the term they use anymore, but the Roma. Um, homosexuals, I mentioned Jehovah's Witnesses, political prisoners, which just means anyone that causes troubles or headaches for the Nazis, and more than any other particular na national group, Polish people were targeted, and the Holocaust took place most infamously in Poland. Um, at any rate, you know, the Nazis had this whole notion of racial hygiene. We have to make Germany more racially hygienic. We have to eliminate these unwanted groups from Europe. We're doing future generations a favor. And this is the final solution. I'll just also note in here this the sick piece that like, um, this isn't happening, this isn't the case back in the 30s, right? Uh, there were efforts to harass these minority groups in the 30s. It's really in like the final stages of the war and especially once it's clear they're not going to win the war, that the Nazis turn up the speed on these on systematic industrial execution and extermination of various people groups. Um, this is, you know, this is the most fearsome genocide of the 20th century. Ten million people killed with fearsome industrial factory-like precision and efficiency. It's insane. It's the darkest of the dark undercurrents of human nature. The war ends in Japan, and the final stages are about as ugly. The United States, led by the United States, there's this what they call the island hopping campaign where the U.S. says we have to kind of, our process of closing in on Japan is going to start over here in Hawaii where, where all this began. Uh, and we're going to sort of skip around from island chain to island chain and make our way to Japan. They're also trying to make their way to the Philippines to free a bunch of American POWs. At Midway is a key turning point because that is really where they cripple Japan's fleet to the point where it's it's clear at that point, even in 1942, Japan's not going to be able to defeat the United States of America. But from 1942 to the middle of 1945, the point of Japan isn't really to defeat the United States. It's to make every step the United States makes in this war a living hell on these miserable tiny islands no one's ever heard of called Iwo Jima and Peleliu and, you know, uh, late Gulf and all these places that no one had ever heard of. And they're just little like weird, they're just places that are small enough to build an airstrip on and use as a bombing, you know, a refueling station for the next bombing raid. But, you know, the Japanese were hiding in caves and fighting to the very end and refusing to surrender which just means that the fighting is slow and laborious and psychologically pretty horrific. Um, and uh, the Japanese refusal to surrender made the whole idea of invading Japan a, a, a terrifying thing to consider because they, I mean, American planners and military officials are saying, I mean, if we're fighting this long at this heavy casualties over Iwo Jima, right? which is about the size of, you know, Chanhassen, Chaska, and Carver put together, then how insane is this going to be when we try and conquer all the Japanese islands, which are about the size of Montana? You know, what is that going to look like? And it's around this time that the Manhattan Project uh, comes to light, you know, and President, now President Truman, is notified that uh, the United States, led by, you know, Dr. Robert J. Oppenheimer, has... Uh, designed a nuclear bomb, an atomic bomb, that is capable of destroying an entire city at once. And uh, President Truman orders, okay, well then we're gonna use this to bring an end to the war now. We're gonna end the war now. We're not gonna, we're not gonna do this invasion of Japan and all the death that would come along with that. 
the calculation is there would actually be less, less death involved, just on a numeric value. There's going to be less deaths if we drop these bombs now on Japan and force them to surrender. And so one bomb is dropped. Japan still refuses to surrender. The second bomb is dropped at that point, uh, urged on by the Japanese emperor, the figurehead emperor, urged on by him, the Japanese military leaders surrender. And that is the awful end of the awful Second World War. And I'm just going to leave it there. Right, we're going to come back after spring break and talk about the aftermath of the war, but I think it's fine right now to just say that's some crazy, crazy, wicked stuff. So we're going to do an LEQ next time, and we'll worry about that. You know, you will be prepping for that, but that is the second half conclusion of the Second World War. Thank you guys for listening on this, and yeah, uh, good luck on your studying.